where you're going! Answer me! I said answer me! I just asked you a question! I, listen, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I got caught off guard. I, I didn't mean to do that, I really apologize. Total accident. The yogi is able to place the candle of his awareness or his attention in a niche within himself where the winds do not make the candle flame move. That is where a sound or a sight or a smell or a taste or a sensation on the skin does not distract him. What is left to distract him, of course, are still his own thoughts, his memories, his plans. And it is here where the discipline that the yogi must impose upon himself becomes uh, exquisitely difficult and uh, something requiring an extraordinary amount of patience. Hi Mitch, it's Mike Lander, 6140769. Uh, it's Thursday evening at about 8.30. I figured maybe I'd be able to catch you uh, in tonight, but I guess I wasn't able to. Um, Hi Mitch, guess what? The screening of the film I worked on, Working Girls, is uh, Wednesday at 8.30 at night with reception and champagne at the Mark Goodson Theater in Columbus Circle. There's a number where I can reach you tomorrow day on Friday, or even I'll try getting you Friday night at the apartment. Turn here, look at each other from eye to eye. Um, at the sub, the, the loft, whatever. I'm very, very interested in it, and, um,. I'd like to, you know, take a look at it as soon as possible. I'm calling about your ad in the Village Voice. My name is Vera. My number is 718-464-5996. Well, you know, Thank you. I'd like to give you, you know, some money, maybe to hold it over, because um, I'd really be interested in moving in there in any case. So um, I'll speak to you later on. Bye-bye. I called to apologize. I feel awful. Um... There's no excuse, but... Yo, Mitch, pick it up, man. Pick it up, you <laughs> there? What? About... My behavior. <laughs> of course, I don't have anybody to go with. Do you, maybe I can go with this chubby guy. <laughs> or maybe you want to go. Anyway, talk to me later today. It's Friday. Bye. We're on Ludlow and Houston, right here in the corner of Cassie's. Katz's is one of the longest establishments that exist still down here that hasn't been gentrified out. It was been here since about 1888, according to the sign here. Now, what's really interesting about this sign is, is that it's a map. It's, uh, it's what used to be here, under the pig, which is gone. Max Fish, uh, which has gone off of this block, it did come back eventually. Uh, TG170 is gone. Uh, Amy Downs is gone. Mary Adams is gone. Bar Monday is gone. 113 Parties is gone. This is all up and down like Ludlow here. Uh, Stewart Park High School obviously is still there, but it's gone through a different configuration. Uh, Gertel's Bakery is gone. Uh, Gus's Pickles is gone. Uh, Delancey Street is still here. So the only permanent thing here, other than the streets and Katz's from this side, is Clayton, which is me. So here we are, uh, and I'm still here. But if you go through this map, these are all small businesses, and it's almost impossible now to run a small business in New York.
story about a poet, you might say. He's really good at being alone. He might lie low with your head hanging down, or look up at a shirt on a door that smells of her and say, she's gone. He might cry either way, but one feels better. I don't see it that way, she said on the phone. It's the truth, I said. I'm vanishing. Do you do it for love? I write poetry totally, 100% for love. There's no other reason to write poetry than for love. Um, I mean, sometimes love is a job, sometimes love is work. Sometimes somebody asks you to write a poem for their wedding. Um, but I would only do that for somebody I loved or um, somebody who paid me a lot of money. Patricia, 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 these are the words that I said. If neither one of us comes out alive, it's certain our love must be dead. Patricia, what's gone through your head? Patricia, Patricia, Patricia Hiding your head in the cloud You took me to the amusement park Now who's laughing out loud? Patricia, come out from the crowd I knew the way she combed her hair That she was glad, she was mighty glad to have me there And I was very glad she came Patricia, Patricia, Patricia these are the words that I said If neither one of us comes out alive It's certain our love must be dead Patricia, what's gone through your head? I love that phase of Andy Warhol's career where he was he had patrons and he wrote he he made portraits for rich people and I'd be thrilled if rich people asked me to write poems for them but I'd be very happy to do that so but so far I, I do it for love and even if rich people asked me to write poems for them I'd probably love them too a tough, a tough denim, denim. But I also think life's too short. Uh, Do you see any parallels between the arts, like poetry and music? Well, this is New York, and there's always been this great alliance between poetry and painting, for sure. And I think it's a healthy one, and I think it's a good one, uh, particularly for the poets. Because I think what a lot of poets in this town are into... Uh, they're they're inspired by a great deal of what's what's on canvas or what's going on with the painters. Yeah. Do you have to go far for inspiration for your poetry? No, I just close my eyes. No inspiration. Uh, I don't. I don't find that a problem. We'll do something here. We may as well. Oculus. Where'd you come up with the term Oculus? Uh, Oculus is just the Latin word for eye. But most of the paintings that I've done have to do with 
uh, thoughts about vision and visual perception. But the Oculus group is the most recent. It involves, well, Oculus generally means the, it's the Latin word for eye, but it also means the tip of the dome of the Pantheon in Rome. And it's also used to describe other round windows and uh, architectural elements. Most of the work derives from a purely artistic internal model. Uh, rather than using objects or uh, scenes from the virtual world, it derives from the imagination. And the search here is primarily for language. And that's to facilitate images that I have not seen. Uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein said to invent a language is to invent a form of life. I primarily think of it as a field in which I'm free to do what I have not seen before. And the form is derived primarily from the layering of paint in the automatic sense. Automatic meaning uh, without conscious planning or independent of an external influence. Do you use spray paint? <sighs> no, after a long period of time of working, I use oil paint because it best reflects uh, these ideas I have about the layering of paint and the drying times. I use paint with an extremely light touch and a variety of brushes. So the effect is one that where the layering is uh, omnipresent but uh, for the most part translucent. The works ultimately involve the process of seeing the image in your mind's eye and then painting it out as it were. Uh, the discipline becomes always holding to the image inside. Always, always holding, holding to the, to the image, image inside. inside. You know, the genius behind uh, New York was cheap rent and inexpensive lifestyle. Uh -huh. And what that meant was people could come here and just about all of the great contributors that came here really started off, um, you know, kind of really on a basic level and somewhat uh, in need of money. Whether that be Madonna or Cyndi Lauper or Jimi Hendrix or people that lived here, uh, Jackson Pollock, Rothko, none of them started off as rich. And then, um, you know, some of the only ways to make it out of the inner city really is with um, art, music, or sports. Hey. So you ready to do some serious work? Let's talk some filmmaking. Yeah, let's review, shall we? So let's see where we're at in this process. We're about, uh, what would you say, about 20 to 30 percent in? See here. 
going to be a lot about iPhones and uh, online dating. So we have a kind of a running theme. I really think people should meet while working their cell phones, working their iPhones. Yeah, they're walking down the sidewalk, they're answering their email, they're texting, and somehow they bump into their next partner. What are the odds of that? So you want to do other couples bumping into each other in different but similar ways. You tell me what's in the can, you tell me what's going to be in the can, and we'll try to figure something out. What's in the can? We got the park people. All right. In Tompkins Square Park. We got the squirrels. We got Simone and Yossi meeting serendipitously, uh, checking out their own iPhones and bumping it into each other. Yeah, we got Frank, uh, the painter. We have a lot of my poetry. All right. We love those disclaimer TV ads with all the stuff that can go wrong with you if you take this little pill. The real nomads in New York are the, the true New York artists. We want to touch on their lives. We want to touch on their work. And little questions like, are they happy? These are the nomads of New York. We're all nomads of New York. All right. Sometimes I'm inspired to write a poem or a line comes into my head. But again, it's more, it does tend to start with a line rather than a feeling. People tend to think that if you're funny, you're not serious. Okay. Baseball wife. She's thinking about him. He's thinking about scoring. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> <laughs> and on the corner here we have uh, luxury uh, Ludlow uh, apartments. It was Ludlow Street where people like Lou Ree started off paying $38 a month to be in a loft. So out of that $38, what did the city get for that $38? We got Lou Ree. Well, I think Lou Reed has really given more to society than, let's say, a McDonald's has. The most impressive buildings in Europe are cathedrals, and in America, banks. A coincidence of manner surrounds the fisted work, glum offices, and current rate of exchange. In the latitude and longitude of exploitation, feeble frames with lingering names ache an incomplete carnality, greet their mornings with hostility. Despair is the empty emotion, a cramped bed, some drizzling sunlight, the speaking clock, your yawning mind. Too often liberty looks like cowardice, Freedom comes unintentionally when the mind rises to meet the chosen occupation necessary for survival. There is no sudden awakening. There is no greatness in death when a martyr longs for his cross. Something I, you know, and they're all writing poetry. Some of it's great. You know, it's bad poetry, but some of it is great bad poetry. So, um... You know, poetry is very complex. I mean, the elite, it tends to elitize itself. You know, the academic poets have their whole gambit going where they're really the elite because they use these words that who knows what they are. You know, words like adamantine. You know, once you've got adamantine in a poem, face it. You know, the story's over. You know, 
that's about it. You've got 19 people to read it in Connecticut, and there goes uh, your uh, poetry. But, uh, but the tragedy is that really the avant-garde or the rebel poets, they also tend to elitize themselves. There's something, I think, inherently competitive about poetry. I think also in, uh, even in China and Japan, historically, where like millions of people would write poems. Like To my knowledge, in um, Japan now, there are millions of haiku poets, and yet how do they organize themselves? There are haiku championships. There are haiku contests. And where they, uh, where they compete to be the best poet. So there's something I don't understand why. Possibly because it's just so easy to write poetry that it tends to to form itself very quickly into an elite. So all the beats who originally seemed, you know, at least exteriorly, to be like a bunch of anybody's writing, you know, uh, with their pen up their asshole. They, uh, you know, very quickly there became the very great beats, the minor beats, the sub-minor beats. Um, so so, um, so I, I think that's in some ways uh, tragic that poetry tends to uh, uh, constantly form an elite. Because, uh, because some of it is somewhat arbitrary, I think. I think Shelley's taken a bad rap, you know, I think he's a great poet, uh, and of course Keats. You're talking about the usual suspects, uh, Wordsworth, Coleridge, people like that, Shelley, Byron, Keats, uh, I, I think I love them as only a cynic can. Uh, I, I think it's some of the greatest poetry ever written, you know, uh, certainly what I like. Uh, you know, the usual things, Tintern Abbey, but, but most especially Byron, because I, I like the way he uh, sort of bridges the, uh, the realistic and, and, and the more s perhaps uh, romantic view of things. But yeah, definitely they're some of them my favorite poets, Coleridge especially. The conversation poems that, that Coleridge and Wordsworth wrote, I, I think they've been a big influence on my work. Uh, the casualness with which they, they use language to, to get into very to deeper things. If some people consider them a little mushy or romantic or sentimental, then but yet they were great poets, then what does that say about poetry itself? Well, I think poetry has to involve feeling or else uh, or, or so human emotion. It, uh, I'm, I don't like poetry that's just all mind games. It doesn't interest me the least. If it's not connected somehow to the human heart, uh, then it just is not enduring, it's not interesting to me. I realize that, yeah, that's what I do work on. I do work on making sure the reader sees it. That's something we learned from Olson, um, to, to the, Olson t taught the heart to the breath, to the line. You follow your breath, but it's the heart that gives rise to what the breath is, um, and they're so interrelated. Think of the word inspire. Um, respire, inspire. We don't have enough people on their computers. More computers. And more iPhones. Mm -hmm. So it's about, it's about pe people are wedded, so wedded to their technology. Wedded to their technology. Exaggerating their resume. Tweaking their age on a dating site. And the person who ain't getting up to that alarm clock. And what kind of excuses for not getting into work that day? Gay guys hand in hand walking along the sidewalk. Lesbians hand in hand showing don't, affection. Don't you have some of that? Get behind stuff like hair products and fracking controversy. We got to get in there. Uh, how about the little dogs in the pet shop window scratching for attention? People 
and dogs. Dogs have a costume party in Tompkins Square Park. The best dressed dog gets a year's supply of dog biscuits. These are the dogs. Where are the people? Why are our people dirty, smelly outcasts and our dogs bought beauty products and condos? This is a poem for canines, not homo sapiens. Homo sapiens sleep on park benches on Avenue A, while dogs are coddled by their masters. We lie down like dogs and get up like people. But who are the dogs and who are the people? And conversely, but look, I am a dog, see? Pet me, stroke my fur, and give me a place to sleep.